capacitors and their equations are super highly tested on the MCAT. So in this video, we're going to go through each of the capacitance equations and how to know when to use each one in MCAT style problems. But let's start by defining capacitors and capacitance. A capacitor is an electronic tool that we use to store electrical energy and release it later. Capacitors generally have two conductive, usually metal, plates that are separated by an insulating material called a dielectric. When a voltage is applied across the plates, an electric field develops in the dielectric, allowing the capacitor to store energy, and then it can release that energy when we flip the circuit. The charge is stored only on the surface of those plates, so the surface area of the capacitor is what matters most in terms of how much energy it can store. I want you to think of capacitors as the opposite of resistors. While resistors dissipate energy as light and heat, capacitors store that energy for later use. We'll see how the capacitance equations line up with this idea that capacitors are opposite of resistors in this video. Now let's dive into the equations and break them down. The first equation I want to discuss is the basic capacitance equation, which we usually use for unit conversions. This is capacitance, or big C, is equal to the charge per volt. All this is saying is that how much capacitance a capacitor has will depend on how much charge is stored per unit voltage that's produced in the circuit. So in terms of units, the SI unit for capacitor is called a farad, F-A-R-A-D after Faraday, who did most of the work on electrical currents and capacitors. A farad is equal to a coulomb, which is our metric unit for charge, over a volt. Now, for our purposes of this video, and I would recommend in your notes, I always write capacitance as CAP because Coulomb is also big C and it can get confusing which is Coulomb and which is capacitance in our equations. So I always write cap for capacitance and C for Coulomb. Now, a volt is a perfectly useful SI unit, but as we also know, a volt can be a joule per Coulomb right? Because a volt is just the energy per coulomb. So if we plug that into the equation, we can see that a farad can also be coulomb squared per joule. So we can always manipulate the units further, but our basic conversion that I want you to know for test day is farad equals a coulomb per volt. It's going to come in handy on a lot of MCAT style questions. Next up, we need to talk about the structure of the capacitor. I'm going to go ahead and draw a quick diagram of a circuit here with a resistor and then a capacitor. And a capacitor is denoted just by two parallel lines as the capacitors we use in a circuit are called parallel plate capacitors. All right, so we have our voltage here, our current moving through here, our resistor in ohms here, and then we have our capacitor here. Now, our parallel plate capacitor can have a specific capacitance, again, based on the surface area and the distance between the plates, right, the amount of dielectric we have. So that equation refers to the structure of the capacitor. So capacitance equals epsilon, or E. This is just referring to the permissivity of the dielectric material. It's a constant in a given capacitance setup multiplied by the surface area of the parallel plates over the distance between the plates. So this A is referring to the surface area. Remember what we said earlier is that the charge lines up on the surface of the plate, so the depth of the plate itself does not matter. It's all about the surface area. And then the distance between the parallel plates is what this distance is referring to distance between the plates. In terms of units, the epsilon is a farad per meter. Area is in meters squared. And then our distance, of course, is in meters. So if we divide it out, what we can see is we end up with just a farad, which is our measure of capacitance. So our units still work themselves out. They always have to do so. Now, you'll very rarely, if ever, need to calculate with this equation. The more important thing is the conceptual relationships. So I want you to notice that if we increase the surface area of the plates, we're going to increase the capacitance of the plates, the amount of charge it can store. If we increase the distance between the plates, however, we make them further apart, we're now decreasing the capacitance. 
that it, the capacitor can store. So to have the most efficient capacitor, we want lots and lots of surface area and a very small distance between the plates. So that's the relationship that's most likely tested for this type of equation. All right, so we've got two equations so far. For general capacitance, especially if they give you coulombs or volts or they ask you for our unit conversions, you'll go ahead and just use Q over V, coulomb per volt equals a farad. If they ask you how we could increase or decrease the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor, this equation is useful, where we can talk about the relative surface area, the distance between the plates, um, and it's more of a conceptual equation of how would I increase or decrease the capacitance with these variables. Our next equations are what happens if we have multiple capacitors. All right, so here we have two different setups. We have capacitors in series. Over here on the left, this is in series. And we have capacitors in parallel. You might recall that for resistors in series, we just add them together to get the total resistance. But for capacitors, it's the opposite. We actually take the reciprocal of the total capacitance equals the reciprocal of capacitor one plus the reciprocal of capacitor two and so on and so forth. If there were multiple more capacitors, that's how we calculate the total capacitors in series. But for parallel, all we do is the total capacitance, capacitance is equal to capacitor one plus capacitor two. All right, so this is what I mean by resistors and capacitors are kind of opposite. For me personally, I don't even have these equations memorized. I just know that they're the opposite of the equations for resistors in series and in parallel. All right, we've got just one equation left, which is calculating the energy stored in a capacitor, which is often the reason we do these calculations in the first place. Before we get there, I'm Amanda Brem. I've been coaching students on their MCAT journeys since 2019. Please remember to subscribe to this channel for more videos on MCAT style content, test taking strategies, and mental fitness tips to help you perform your best on test day. And if you'd like more interactive in-depth lessons on topics like these, including passage strategy and test taking skills, go ahead to the link in the caption below, which will take you to register for my next available MCAT course. All right, let's talk about that final equation for capacitors, which is the energy stored in a capacitor. So the energy stored in a capacitor is a potential energy measure, so it's gonna be denoted as U, and the equation is one half capacitance voltage squared. Kind of looks like our kinetic energy equation, right? One half MV squared, right? Or even our energy stored in a spring, one half KX squared. So you'll see in general, uh, the energy equations kind of look similar to each other where we have the capacitance and then our movement or our voltage squared um, multiplied by one half. So energy always in joules, right? We always know our energy is in joules. Capacitance is in a farad, which we've discussed is a coulomb per volt. And then of course our volt squared is just volts squared. So if we multiply this, we're ignoring the one half for just a second, we can see that one of our volts cancels and we now have a coulomb times a volt. Is that equal to a joule? Well, if we recall, a volt is a joule per coulomb. So yes, our coulombs cancel out and we absolutely get joules. Remember, the units always have to work themselves out. However, this is an equation that you will want to memorize because of that one half value. All right, so in order to calculate the energy stored in a capacitor, we will have to multiply by 0.5, the capacitance, and then the voltage squared. Oftentimes in a circuit setup, we know the voltage and we know the capacitance, right? It'll be like a 12 volt battery and a 10 microfarad capacitor. As a general rule, the kind of capacitors we use in a circuits tend to be in microfarads. So just make a note that you'll probably have to convert to our base units of farads to do our calculation. One microfarad equals 10 to the negative six farads. So just be on the lookout for the microfarad versus farad because if we're going to do calculations with these equations, it needs to be in our base units. It needs to be in farads. All right, but that's it for energy stored in a capacitor. You just need to memorize this equation. One half capacitance voltage squared. And remember that our units work themselves out. Our unit for our energy stored in a capacitor will be a joule. All right, let's do a quick recap of the equations so we know what they are and when to use them. For general equations of capacitance and unit conversions, use our capacitor equals coulombs per volt. 
For our capacitance in a parallel plate capacitor, where they're asking what would increase or decrease the capacitance, like the structure of the capacitor, go ahead and use our capacitance equals our epsilon, our permissivity, times surface area divided by the distance between the plates. To calculate the total capacitance of capacitors in series, remember to use the reciprocal equation. 1 over capacitance total equals 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2, so on and so forth. For capacitors in parallel, remember we just add them together to get the total capacitance. So capacitor 1 plus capacitor 2 equals the total capacitance in parallel. And finally, if we are asked for the energy stored in a capacitor, or we're given the energy stored in the capacitor and asked for voltage or capacitance, go ahead and use U, potential energy stored, equals one half capacitance voltage squared. All right, go ahead and add these equations and when to use them to your notes. And if you found this video helpful, please share it with your pre-med community. Remember, studying for the MCAT can be hard and stressful, and we all need a little help once in a while. Thanks so much and happy studying. Thank you.